am I good to start? Brilliant. Okay, so um, yeah, the joys of the hybrid world. So we are doing a live stream at the same time, which is great because those people that have missed uh, today will be able to look at it online on our YouTube channel and look at it live right now. Um, so I think I recognise a lot of you, but not everyone. Um, so I'm Cara Jenkinson from Muswell Hill Sustainability Group. Uh, warm welcome uh, to everyone this evening uh, and online. Um, so this is part of our uh, Green Open Homes uh, series of talks. Uh, we've been running Green Open Homes for nine years now, and it involves people opening up their homes that have done you know, good eco stuff for people to learn from and to come and be inspired by. And really pleased that the first weekend that we've run, which was the weekend just gone, has gone really well. Uh, lots of bookings, lots of new people. Um, so that's great. And then this is the first in a series of talks that we're going to be doing every Tuesday uh, during October on a variety of different themes. Um, any events, you've got the open homes weekends coming up this uh, weekend, so please do book if they're not booked out already. I know not all of them are. We've added a, um, a very interesting house uh, this week, which is the big deep retrofit on Muswell Hill Road. So anyone wanting to see that, it's a great opportunity to see that. And the architect working on that is going to be speaking on the 25th of October. Uh, so, the subject for this evening is uh, energy uh, prices, uh, and I'm sure most people will realise that energy prices have shot up uh, because of the uh, Russia-Ukraine situation, uh, but there's a lot more going on uh, uh, in terms of the way the energy market works in the UK, the impact of that on prices, what that means now, what that means in the future. Um, and really delighted to have uh, Professor Mark Barrett here, uh, who is a professor uh, at UCL in Energy and Environmental uh, Systems Modelling. Um, and actually, uh, Dermot Barnes and myself know the Energy Institute, where Mark uh, was a founder member uh, very well, because we both did master's uh, courses there uh, in the last few years. So they really know the stuff about energy modelling and energy generally. So it's a real uh, pleasure to introduce Mark. All right, thank you. Thanks, Cara. Um, well, really nice to see you all here this evening. Um, I'll try and go through reasonably quickly to leave some time for question and discussion at the end, but shout, when you get bored, shout at me to, if you've got a question or something like that, because that makes it more interesting for me. Um, then I learn for the next time I uh, drone on and on. Um, and also, um, I probably want to get away fairly promptly afterwards, so uh, uh, we'll, we'll try and get on with it. Next slide, please. So. Um, why energy prices have shot up. I'm going to take a slightly wider view on this um, and look at energy costs and prices, both the past history of energy prices, um, the present crisis, and um, in a way what is more important uh, to overcome these short-term uh, crises, what's going to happen, what we can do in the future uh, with an energy system. So next slide, please. <coughs> I thought so. Yeah. Okay. Just shout, sh shout if I'm if I'm off screen, won't you? Is that the good side? Or? Okay. Um, so I'm sorry. The uh, text is a bit small. I hope you can read it. I can barely do it. So I'm going to look a little bit at consumption and supply. My focus here is going to be on gas rather than oil, um, for uh, reasons which we can come back to. I'm going to have a little bit of a look at how costs, energy costs and then prices are determined and then look a little bit about the options for uh, managing the energy bills by reducing consumption and then finally to look at a scenario I've been developing called green light which is a longer term scenario going into the future where we reduce our dependency on fossil oil and gas um, to a very large extent. Next slide, please. Right. <clears throat> well, global gas. The thing is that gas and oil and indeed coal are all global commodities, globally traded uh, in different ways. Um, the reserves of gas up here, you can't read it, but this is uh, Russia, America, uh, China, but a lot of that is shale gas. Shale gas is the gas that you get uh, underground within shale rocks 
was the, called fracking, it was obviously a big debate at the moment. And then here we have a lot of reserves in the Middle East, and, and particularly Qatar, we import a lot of gas from Qatar. Um, but a pretty large concentrations, particularly in North Asia, um, Siberia has, I, I don't know, 40% of the world uh, provable reserves. <clears throat> and um, gas is basically methane, most of it. It has other uh, pollutants or uh, con constituents, but it's mainly methane. And it's traded in two ways. First, by inflexible pipe routes, where you build these long-distance transmission lines across, across Siberia. And, of course, we know the Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 pipelines have just been uh, sabotaged by all probability. We don't know who by. Um, but they have fixed routes. And so if you're a seller into a pipeline, you can't just say, well, you know, if, if your pipeline goes to Germany, you can't say to, let's say, Japan, what will you give us for the gas? You've got a fixed market uh, there, and that tends to restrain prices and you have long-term contracts. Then the other way gas is traded is liquefied natural gas, LNG, where you take the methane and you compress it and chill it to about minus 150 centigrade and liquefy it. And you put it into big tanks, then the ship comes in and you offload onto the ship, which has big containers in, and then it steams off across the seas to the point of destination. It's offloaded into big tanks again uh, and then uh, expanded and put into the gas supply. Now the thing about LNG is it has a lot of overheads in terms of the energy and the emissions incurred in transporting it. Pipelines do too. There's a lot of energy used for compressors and so on in the pipelines and there's a lot of leakage. Who knows how much the Russian pipelines are leaking? It's very poorly understood. So the gas trade um, causes uh, emissions of methane and CO2. So we can see here a little uh, trading map, which again is too small to read really. But these blue lines is uh, seaborne LNG. And our, a lot of our gas comes from Qatar, through the Gulf, uh, through the Suez Canal, uh, and, 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 and into Britain. Um, in America, it's a bit more self-contained. A lot of shale gas there, which has uh, reduced prices um, there, um, and uh, uh, some in South America. But there's basic... No. 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 No, it just it costs too much. Um, you know, once they found out you could just make a hole in the, in the sea floor and out the gas came up, it just use of coal has just uh, disappeared. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So how are gas prices determined? Well, it's pretty complicated, really. There are costs uh, for gas. So uh, for e exploration, production, you have to drill wells, uh, maintain them, and so on. Uh, you have to process the gas, because it may have pollutants, carbon dioxide, uh, 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 sulphur maybe in it, and then transport it by pipe and ship, as I've just explained, and storage. And this is quite a costly infrastructure uh, that you need uh, for producing wholesale gas. And these, these uh, gas supplies go into international markets. And they're partly regional, actually, because of the cost of transport. So you have a sort of North American market, which is rather separate from the Japanese market, which is rather separate from a European market. And then the gas is landed, the wholesale gas is landed and put into networks, which are quite expensive, networks of distribution pipes in the streets out there. And we have retailers, suppliers, who buy the gas from wholesalers and then uh, supply through contracts to uh, consumers. And then we have a whole range of taxes and subsidies and uh, I can't quite read it, unfortunately. Um, yeah, so here's a breakdown of the cost of supply. Of course, this is changing day by day, but that's wholesale costs there from, uh, from these, these large markets. And then there's the cost of networks. 
And there's a whole range of other costs like VAT, operating costs, and so forth. So if we look at the um, historical wholesale prices going from about 2005, I think, 2004, um, you can see quite a lot of variation there. And then we get this big increase in Japan. That's a Japanese market there. A lesser increase in Europe, but still an increase, whereas the, ch the American uh, prices just sort of gradually go down. And this shows how interconnected the global system is. The reason for that big increase is Fukushima. Because Fukushima um, was, was uh, destroyed by the tsunami and several other, then they shut down nuclear stations. They needed electricity, so they imported LNG to drive the gas generators, and that caused a surge in demand on the global market and a surge in prices. So it just shows how things are interconnected, and by the way, it shows one of the drawbacks of nuclear power, uh, in that it can actually cause crises. And there's an interesting uh, byline. If I asked you which energy source, which electricity source, wind or solar or nuclear, across the year is most reliable? And the answer is wind. Because nuclear power stations, they can shut down 50% has been shut down in the UK and historically, and this goes on for months. And you need to replace that electricity with something else. With wind, is plus or minus 10% over the year. So when they say nuclear power is baseload, don't believe them. Next slide, please. Um, so, there are these variable factors driving wholesale prices. Um, so one longer term one is declining gas production by the UK. So about 45% currently of gas demand in the UK is met with our continental reserves. And um, there used to be quite a large gas store called uh, Rough Storage. And if you, the more storage you have, the more you can uh, contract against these variations in prices. If you have very little storage and the price, then that's what you have to pay. So that's one issue, storage and declining gas production. Um, there's been more in, in imports by uh, liquefied natural gas. Now the thing about liquefied natural gas is that once it's on the ship out at sea, you might have a spot market. So you're out there on the ship and you say, well, how much, Japan, how much will you give me for this LNG? And then you say to the UK, how much will you give me? And so they can be competing with each other, whereas the pipeline gas, you can't do that. So it's quite an interesting uh, thing. Then, of course, um, the big reason, uh, recent one is the invasion of U Ukraine, is war. Um, but, of course, we must remind ourselves that this is a war affecting gas supply in Europe, but there have been many wars affecting oil supply over the last 50 years, and more, actually. 50, yeah, more than 50 years. So, the main reason for uh, large-scale price increases and shortage of supply is political. It's always been political. It's not that the gas reserves suddenly run out or the, the oil reserves suddenly run out. It's very, very slow. Then, of course, just in the last uh, two or three weeks, we've had gas pipeline sabotage. And this, again, is the vulnerability of the gas uh, means of transport of gas. Um, other things, a very large fraction of gas is used for uh, heating, of course, and for um, generation uh, of electricity. And in general, the longer and the more severe the winter, the more gas you use, both for heating directly and for electricity generation. At the same time, over the last year, we've had low output from hydro, particularly in Norway. And, um, and again, hydro you think is quite a reliable source of electricity, but actually you get very long-term droughts, like in Brazil, Colombia at the moment, and in Norway is going on. And so you might have very low hydro output for a year or two years or three years. We don't really know. All we do know is that the severity and frequency of these extremes is increasing. Sorry, the, the slides are so small and these three interesting graphs are being a bit wasted on us to go to that. Uh, can you take us through what the red line is in the top graph? 
Uh, yeah. Can I just finish this box here, and then I will do that. Yeah. Um, so nuclear, um, the UK output's not been too bad recently, but the French nuclear stations are in real trouble. And one of the reasons for that is technical faults, but another one is the rivers are warmer and lower, so you can't call your power stations anymore. So it's, it's interesting how all these things uh, intertwine. Um, and actually, it was rather poor windier as well. Uh, and then finally, other regions are buying more gas. So particularly, uh, there's a new pipeline from Russia to China, uh, the Asian countries, partly to try and uh, uh, replace coal, uh, but also to meet increasing demand with economic growth, uh, are using more gas. Um, well, um, you're going to an area where I don't have that deep knowledge, I have to say, but um, usually gas contracts are sort of week or two weeks ahead and more, um, and they could go on for a year or two. Um, but that's about the size of it, really. Um, uh, um, and obviously you can hedge against... The question is, the question is, what is your gamble when you're contracting in long term? I'm, I'm sure they will. Um, that'll be LNG from America. Um, I don't know the detail. I'm, I'm, I'm slightly skating on thin ice, actually, throughout this talk. I do know quite a lot about the generality of it, but when it comes into in-depth uh, information on contracts, it's incredibly complicated, because obviously you've got, I don't know, you know, 50 suppliers and 50 consumers, and they've got all sorts of different uh, things going on there. Um, Sorry? Well, that's true. But if, if we're gas suppliers and you, th you, know, you think, well, I'm going to make huge profits, then I'll undercut you. So there is competition in the market. I don't think so. You don't think so? Right. Um, Okay, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> it's evasive action, really. Uh, yeah. So this chart here, uh, which the lady asked over there, um, this uh, orange line, oh, I can't walk over here, is oil prices. Um, and the green line is gas and electricity. So you can see it's bimbling along there, and then wham. You're getting this quadrupling factor of 10, whatever, in, in, in gas prices. Depends which day you choose to compare, actually. And um, so, f because of all these factors, and there are probably other ones, this is the kind of uh, hysterical uh, uh, fluctuations that you get in prices here. Um, so, it's very tough to accurately project and plan your heating systems, your generation systems. You know, your industry using gas for, uh, I don't know, making glass, for example, is very difficult. And so they have a go at it. So down the bottom here is a gas price projection made by Bayes in 2017. And um, it's starting here, 2017. And that is the um, history there. And you can see their projections actually don't even get quite, as, only just get as high as they were historically four or five years before. And this triangle here is the current gas price. <laughs> so it's hopeless, isn't it? <laughs> um, so this, this is why they've been caught nappy. It's complacency with projections like this. And it's very interesting to read their commentary on this saying, we can't foresee a, a, a crisis for political or technical or any reason. <laughs> and then, well, five years later, here we are. Next, please. 
Um, so UK gas, um, historic, we've got decreasing UK production. So provided demand is greater than production, we're going to have increasing imports. And that's the situation we're in. Um, there's a strong seasonal variation in gas consumption and the price and the supply mix. So um, here's a sort of quarterly uh, history of uh, gas consumption. Um, and um, you can see that you need what are called sort of swing producers who need to supply more in the winter because the UK has about five days storage. There's no way it can store enough gas, build up the stalls in the summer and go through the winter, um, even if they reopen this rough field. So UK actually has less storage than most European countries. And as you saw before, we're at the wrong end of the pipeline from Siberia. You know, China's nearer to Siberia than we are. Um, and so we're, you know, we're gonna have to suffer the highest prices really. Um, the leading supply, suppliers of gas uh, um, is Norway. Um, but, but again, it's contingent on other countries around Norway because all the countries are interconnected. And the second largest here is Qatar. So that's LNG coming in uh, on ships. Um, this is one forecast of the uh, uh, dependency on, uh, of the UK on imported gas. So it's going from, at the bottom there, 45% uh, going up to 70% here. It's just one projection, of course. And, of course, if we go for a uh, uh, renewable energy system, then we don't have to, we don't have to suffer this kind of uh, dependency on imports. Uh, next slide, please. So that's a bit about gas. Um, electricity um, is, if anything, more complicated than gas. Um, we have supply costs. And basically, we build generators, and we need capital expenditure for that, operation and maintenance, and, of course, buy. And some of this capital investment is just through private investment, people speculating that they'll build a generator and make, make profits from it. But there are also other means, that the capacity auctions, where the government says we want wind or solar, and they auction them. And, and of course, this has been incredibly successful. So the, the costs of wind and solar uh, through such auctions have fallen by 80% over the last 15 years. So. I'm not a Tory, but you have to thank them for that. <laughs> um, it's been very, very successful. Um, and then, um, of course, we have networks again. So if we have a breakdown here of the electricity costs. So here's the wholesale cost, which is smaller than for gas. We have network costs here. And then we have a whole lot of um, social obligation costs for efficiency and so on, as is basically um, taxes on electricity to supply to subsidise uh, energy efficiency. The wholesale in, uh, electricity market is very complex, but basically what happens is you're all generators and you say, I'll offer electricity tomorrow at 10 o'clock at uh, 3p a kilowatt hour or 2p a kilowatt hour. So we take all your bids for the amount of power and the price and we sort them so that we go from the lowest cost to the highest cost. And so you, you go through this merit order, so-called, until you've got enough power to meet demand the following day. And that is the marginal generator. And the cost of that generator sets the price of electricity. So as we go through, obviously you've got wind and solar, and they've got no marginal costs. Once you've built them, the marginal cost of renewables is, is very near zero. But what does cost a lot is when you have to turn the gas generators on because there's not enough electricity. And so the system price is made by gas. And that's why electricity is the same as gas. This is something I'll come on to a bit later. Because um, what's going to happen when almost all our electricity 
comes from renewables and nuclear, with almost no fuel costs. And half the time we're going to have too much wind and solar, more than we can consume. What's the system marginal price going to be then? And this is a very complex, difficult intellectual problem, as setting prices when we have a system like that. Um, but even now you can see, here's an example of about, it's about a week of daily prices. And typically, of course, the, uh, the price is low when demand is low, so you have low demand at night, p uh, uh, morning peak, sort of plateau in the middle of the day, and then an evening peak when you're at home cooking a, cooking a nut roast, probably, people here. <laughs> um, and, but this kind of fluctuation may become much more extreme, because you may be going along and, well, we've got a surplus of offshore wind, so I think that, oh, we've got a deficit here, we've got to turn on our gas, bang, big spike in prices. And this is going to be very difficult to manage. We don't know how, uh, how we're going to um, sort this out. Um, next slide, please. Now, um, this is a, a horrible slide. I, I'm not going to... If you want to, I can come back and go through this, but it's basically explaining the retail market, the wholesale market, and this marginal pricing um, that goes on now. I've generally left links in there, and you're welcome to use the PowerPoint and look through those. Next slide, please. So, what are the options for reducing energy bills, apart from efficiency, just for the, for the moment? Uh, one idea is uh, maybe you increase the cost per kilowatt hour with the number of kilowatt hours you consume. So your first 5,000 kilowatt hours, let's say, are a very low price. So poor households, generally, um, this is, uh, I think this, yeah, this is, uh, it's, it's going really, but the, um, the richer the household, the more energy you consume. So in general, uh, uh, richer people consume more. This is the percentage of your income spent on energy going from the lowest income to the highest income. And you can see basically the lower your income, the more you spend on energy. Partly, partly because um, you're living in the worse housing generally. So that's one option is to uh, have a sliding uh, cost per kilowatt hour. And this would encourage, of course, energy efficiency. But there is a risk, because some large households, low incomes, uh, bad housing, could still consume a lot of energy. Um, the option the government's gone through is a blanket subsidy, basically, is just to reduce the prices of gas and electricity across the board to all people. So this is a, effectively a regressive tax, um, um, but it has the advantage it's simple. Um, but maybe increasing income is the better option, as always, of these situations, rather than trying to put a plaster on what is basically a bad situation. Um, another bit of statistic here, uh, older householders use more energy per person. So it's partly, probably quite a few in the audience here, like me. My children left home and I'm still in the family house. So I've got a great big house uh, and there's just two of us. And so older households tend to use much more energy than younger households. Also, they're at home more of the time and they may want uh, a, a higher temperature. Next slide, please. Um, this, again, is, is too much to go through. But so the government has decided on a support where the idea is to reduce the cost of gas and electricity per kilowatt hour and the standing charges to cap those so that for a typical household, and this keeps coming up, um, you know, the bill's going to be £2,500 a year. But of course there will be a lot of variety in there. This will apply for two years. And the non-domestic, um, again, is a cap on the electricity and gas cost, but it's only applying for six months. Um, the cost of the package, it's a guess, of course, absolute guess, is maybe £150 billion. Uh, and additionally, the government's providing 40 billion as a liquidity facility for the, to help the energy uh, companies. Um, 
Fossil fuel industry, um, I'm not conversant really with the data on this. There's a lot of subsidies going to the fossil fuel industry and some put it at uh, about 14 billion over the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, profits estimated maybe the um, gas and uh, electricity producers will make uh, 170 billion pounds extra profit over the next two years which happens to be about the same order as the cost there, by coincidence. Of course, it's a, it's, it's a guess, of course. Um, there has been a windfall tax applied of 25% to profits from May, which might raise about 5 billion. Um, but um, the European Union is, is coming in with much larger windfall, uh, windfall profit taxes. Next slide, please. So um, that's really talking a little bit about costs and prices and subsidies. Um, <clears throat> options for reducing gas demand, we can maybe split there. Fast temporary measures, um, turn your thermostat down, clothing, blankets, this kind of thing. But there's probably a risk attached to that because people might get cold uh, inadvertently and suffer ill health. Um, Looking forward, we again have behavioural measures, thermostats, clothing, things called personal comfort systems where you, you heat, heat your seat or the sofa or your bed rather than the whole room and this can save a lot of energy and be implemented fairly quickly. And then we have slow permanent measures like energy efficiency and the electrification of heating and cooling. Next slide please. A bit more on energy efficiency. Buildings, of course, is a common thing. Um, and, but there is a question, which is becoming more important now. Will high levels of insulation cause overheating? We had that heat wave last summer, and insulation generally will reduce the heat load, but it will increase the cooling load too, unless you're very careful what you do with the insulation. And this is becoming a more and more important uh, factor, I think. Um, there's probably going to be a growth in the number of households as, uh, as uh, households get smaller, so there'll be more, more households. Population growth is still projected, although most of that will come from immigration because the average British woman has about 1.7 children at the moment. Um, and so there's not going to be that many new buildings, maybe 20% of the stock in 2050. And of course these new buildings, you can, if you get your standards right, uh, uh, reduce the energy loads of those. Um, <clears throat> retrofit has a fairly small potential actually. There's low cost measures like loft insulation, cavity wall, double glazing, which can be done at low cost. But a lot of that has already been done. If you want to go further and do internal or external wall insulation, or ventilation, heat recovery, the costs become very high. And there is a real problem here whether it's for insulation or for your heat pump or whatever, is how do households meet the capital costs of these things? A deep retrofit might cost 50,000 or 70,000 um, pounds. Easier options, appliances and equipment, like your refrigerator and you know, your electric oven or whatever, um, have fast turnover and you can increase the efficiency quite rapidly, or lighting. Um, so there's been a big improvement in that over the last 20 years, such that electricity consumption is going down, which is quite contrary to the scenarios when I first started out looking at the energy. Um, and transport, um, there's a lot you can do with vehicle efficiency and operation. One really big thing is small cars. If you get a small car as opposed to an average car, it will reduce energy consumption by 30 or 50 percent. This applies to electric vehicles as well as to petrol or diesel. And this, because a car lasts 15 years, has a very rapid effect. Um, and you can have the efficient ships and trains and so on. Next slide, please. So, going forwards, um, we need an overall strategy to decarbonise the energy system. Um, we can increase efficiency. We can replace fossil fuels with renewable electricity and some residual nuclear. We probably accept that Hinkley will operate. Uh, but maybe no other new stations, so they'll all be gone by 2050. Um, but we may need to use fossil oil for aviation. I'll come back to that. 
We can electrify heating and cooling and road and rail transport. We use electricity to make from water and air, hydrogen for industry, ammonia for ships, so we can cover all of that. Uh, but we may still have some CO2 emissions left, for example, from making cement. Um, and then we might use electricity to absorb and store CO2 from the atmosphere. People are building machines to actually absorb the CO2. Next slide, please. Um, so designing a national energy system is a difficult task. Particularly, whereas at the moment we use stored fuels. Fossil, oil and gas and coal, they're stored energy. So when you need more energy, you just open the valve or shove more coal into the furnace or whatever. With wind and solar, they come when they come. And it's down to uh, chance. And so we have a much more difficult problem of meeting varying demands with varying supplies of renewables. And this is where a lot of work, this is what I particularly focus on. So we have our end use uh, sectors there, domestic, service sectors, industry, transport. And over here we have our primary energy resources. So we have our fossil, gas, oil and coal and nuclear there, stored energy. But then we have these variable sources of wind and solar. And we have to devise a system in between here which will convert this electricity into heat and district heating or in heat pumps or use the electricity to make hydrogen which we then use to make ammonia to drive ships or electricity which is going into our electric vehicles <coughs> here. And we need this system to operate hour by hour across the year whatever the weather, whatever the social activities. Um, and we all system, um, so that this is done, it might be national grid or something. This is a one of the most challenging sides of it, actually. How do we control this system uh, so that we match demands and supplies hour by hour across the year um, and maybe have some sort of competition or incentive not to use too much energy? Next slide, please. So um, looking at building space conditioning, we can have insulation and solar control to uh, reduce overheating. We might have a heat pump like this, a reversible heat pump which heats and cools, so it provides resilience against climate change. Um, and, or, or we might have district heating. Hydrogen is suggested. I think hydrogen is very, very expensive and it doesn't cool, so I think that's not an option. The problem here is helping households with the costs. These costs maybe 10,000 pounds, rather than a replacement boiler for two, three, four, five thousand pounds. Um, other heating and cooling in industry, we can do with heat pumps, the same things. And then we have electric vehicles, um, which we must remind ourselves are buildings on wheels. So they use more energy when it's cold, and they use more energy when it's hot, for heating and for cooling. So they are also climate sensitive. Next slide, please. So, um, one of the scenarios I've built is where um, most electricity comes from wind. That's wind there. So you can see the growth of wind up to there. Quite a bit from, uh, this is offshore wind, quite a bit from solar PV, a little bit from onshore wind, which may be problematic because of the environmental impact. Um, and here's, uh, here's the fossil disappearing, and that's nuclear, and we've just got the little hinkly rump which might be still operating in 2050. One thing about this is that um, 20 or 30 percent of the electricity generated is not used, it's spilled. Because it's more expensive to build storage and electrolyzers and so on to use that electricity than it is to build more wind turbines or solar panels than you need. It's a slightly surprising uh, thing. Um, and actually the unit cost per kilowatt hour, you get this big reduction from current fossil prices. This is a, a lower cost system. Next slide, please. Um, just to give you an example of the complexity, I'll have a winter's day, so we have big, big peaks of heating there. There's our electric vehicle charging in the middle of the day. Sorry, Mark. For the folks in the live stream, can you just reference which little graph you're all talking about when you, because they can't see your pointer. All right, middle, middle chart, top here. Um, we've got, um, you know, it's cold in the morning, a lot of heating at night, not much in the middle of the day. And on this particular day, 
We've got plenty of wind during the night and we've got a bit of solar in the middle of the day, but then we run out uh, in the uh, you know, late afternoon, early evening. So we have to then use our electricity storage and a bit of uh, fossil gas just to uh, fill, fill, up, fill up the deficit there. This will happen very rarely. But you can see the complexity uh, of, of the problem there. And here we have in the summer, so we have uh, the top right chart, we have a big peak of heating in the middle of the day when the temperature is highest and we've got most solar. Quite nice thing about that is that obviously in the summer you have more solar and it's correlated very well with air conditioning. So you have to look at all of these things when you're trying to design a high renewable system. Next slide, please. Um, so here's a transition um, over the years. Um, biomass, I assume only bio wastes are used. I think bio crops, uh, and so on, um, or biomass imports should not be allowed because of the environmental impacts. And if we start importing biomass, as we do from North America for Drax power, just change our reliance from gas to imported biomass. And everybody's going to want biomass because it's the only, it's the principal renewable energy form that's got storage integral to it. Whereas wind and solar obviously don't. So we see uh, our gas consumption dwindles to zero, our oil consumption uh, with the one exception, dwindles to zero, and this is flexible fueling, which might be oil and gas. Um, we still have our biomass there, the green line, uh, pretty much constant, but we still have this fossil oil here, and that's aviation. I'll come on to that now. Next slide, please. Um, so here's our chart for CO2 in this particular uh, um, scenario. So the CO2 from gas falls to zero and oil falls to zero and flexible fuels falls to zero. But here is our fossil kerosene for aviation and that's still emitting this much in 2050 in this scenario. So we have to balance that emission with negative emissions here. So you can see that's under the line and that's direct air capture where we're sucking CO2 out of the air and storing it under the ground. People won't like this, but the challenge is, can you make zero carbon kerosene for a start? Well, let's go on, actually. Next slide, please. So this is the fly in the ointment, is aircraft. Aircraft emit CO2 from burning kerosene, but also where they fly 10 or 12 kilometers altitude, they emit water vapor and oxides of nitrogen and these pollutants cause further global warming of about the same magnitude as the CO2. So it, it's really difficult. So even if you're using hydrogen or biofuels, you've still got this high altitude warming. And so for me, I, I thought, well, is it best to try and make zero carbon aviation fuels by taking CO2 out of the air? making hydrogen from water and electricity, combining the two in a Fischer-Tropsch process to make synthetic kerosene, very costly, and you still need the direct air capture uh, out of the air. So I thought it's a lower cost solution to keep on using uh, aviation, uh, uh, fossil kerosene, um, than it is to try and replace it. Yeah, Sorry? Yeah, well, good luck with that. Well, of course everybody's... Yeah, of course you're right. Of course you're right. This actually assumes uh, no increase in a aviation demand. Uh, you know, you might, you might assume, OK, I, I think I could halve that. Uh, good, luck, good luck with that. <laughs> it's terribly, terribly hard. And the problem is that, 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 you know, in four hours of flying, that's your annual... CO2 quota is gone. You can't do any cooking or lighting or travelling by car or by train. That's the lot, just in a, in a few hours. Um, I worked a lot on this 30 years ago now. Um, it's the most depressing sector of all. 
because there's no technical solution, unlike for everything else. Um, and what that means is that most of the direct air capture you're doing is to balance aviation. So it costs, the cost of aviation is about 25% of the total energy system cost. It's absolutely huge. And nobody knows what to do about it. I mean, demand management, of course, you're right, and you can take trains, but once you go beyond a thousand kilometers, that's a pretty long train ride. Um, if you've got a solution, you know, you'll, you'll be famous forever. <laughs> um, and this is just an indication. Um, um, if you add the CO2 costs onto aviation, it's going to add about like, 50 to 100 pounds an hour to your flight cost. And so it will increase uh, going to Spain. Instead of 60 pounds, it will cost you 300 pounds. All right. So that's, um, you know, that's the way, okay, so you can say, well, you can fly. Australia, instead of 1,200 pounds, it's 3,500 pounds. You know, absolutely huge increase. And, you know, provided these sums of money go into balancing aviation, well, you might say, okay. But, of course, the rich people fly now, but it's going to be the very rich who will fly in the future. Um, next slide, please. Finally, um, system costs. So the great thing about green light, these zero, net zero systems, or high renewable systems, is they use less fossil fuels, so they're less vulnerable to imports and international markets. So you much more security, both, and, and the system costs are reduced, as less fossil fuel is used, assuming 2022 20, fuel prices. And the costs are dominated by capital and fixed operation and maintenance. There's very little volatility. So here we have the cost transition. This is the capital cost here, the green. This is the operation and maintenance cost of the system. That's the gas cost going to zero. That's the oil cost going to zero. I've seen there. So the capital cost of the system increases to um, of the order of uh, three times the current capital value of the energy system and as a percentage the fuel costs fall down to quite a low level. So what this tells you is you know if this triples it's less of a problem than if that triples. So um, it means much less volatility in pricing in the future. Um, we are left with this thing talking about coming back to prices briefly is that most of the costs are now fixed. You've got your wind turbines, you've got your solar panels, you've got your heat pumps there. There's no fuel cost to speak of. So this cost is incurred with your bank loans, whatever, you, whatever happens during the year. So how do you price your electricity hour by hour in that system? And answers on a postcard. And again, if you solve that and aviation, you'll be double no prize winners. Um, next slide, please. Thanks ever so much. Yeah, I'm quite sceptical about quite a lot of what you showed, to tell you the truth. Um, I remember we had a presentation here a few years ago about a guy who came in and showed the pathway to net zero. Remember the guy who... And he, had, he was illustrating all the things the country should do to get to net zero. And I remember asking, well, what about new technologies? And he said, well, I haven't included that because we don't know about it. And it was very thinking that, well, yeah, you're going to indicate what you need to do to accommodate vested interests at the moment. And I think a lot of what you show accommodates vested fossil fuel interests rather than really look at what could be done to sort this out. You know, the other question I was going to ask you was, are you angry? Because how bad could the government have got this? To look at this the situation we're in today and not be angry about it, I find it incredible, absolutely incredible. Um, 
Well, anger is very tiring, I find. And um, what I try to do here, these are technologies you can buy today. Okay? You know, offshore wind, you know, they're out there. Thousands of them already. And the costs are coming down very reliably. Um, and it will mean much less fossil fuel use. So this is changing industry quite radically away from oil and gas and it's going to go, a lot of the money is going to go into, into renewables. Now that's the sort of technologies and the costs of those technologies and how they perform. The first thing I try to do is design a system that will meet demands hour by hour across the year in all sorts of different weather and at a minimum cost. Now then there's a matter of how, how this is funded what the regulations and law uh, incentives, either way, are needed to get this stuff into place. Are we going to have a great bit of energy? You know? Or actually has, in some ways, the auctioning of wind and solar capacity has been very effective in driving down costs, I think. Um, so I haven't gone into the deep depth of the politics here, um, but all I will say is that we've gone from barely nothing to uh, something like 30% of our electricity now generated with renewables apart from tracks in, in the last 15 years. Okay, oh sorry, I thought Dermot was next. Oh, okay, uh, right, two quick ones then. What do you think of Dale Vince's idea of hydrogen from grass? And I've heard that the energy suppliers are able to take out insurance to um, guarantee a certain price for their products and that we are also paying for that along with all the other things we're paying for. Um, hydrogen from grass I think is nonsense. <laughs> okay, in a word, I can go into it. The problem with plants is they're wonderful and beautiful but they're very inefficient. So you, to get a large amount of energy, you need huge areas of land which you can grow grass on, so it's not total wasteland. So I think it's a, just a no-no. And, and I read a report from Imperial College, maybe someone you're referring to, and I think it's full of holes. Yeah. Oh, uh, insurance. Well. There is a problem. You say, okay, let's say you want offshore wind. How do you get it built? And so you come along and you might be a private investor. You might be a community um, who you're banding together to buy an offshore wind turbine. Um, so you could say, well, this, this is going to cost us 50 million pounds or whatever it is. How do you ensure that you're going to get a return on your investment? Is it just, well, 50 million and then we have free electricity? No, it won't be like that, because you won't get it all from that one turbine. And so there is a problem here of how we reward people invest, whoever they may be, whether it's government, whether it's communities, whether it's private investors. They need some sort of revenue from the capital investment, otherwise they won't do it. Simple as that. And that's where I think the, you know, the government is asking for review at the moment of the uh, energy market. And uh, we've thought a lot about this, and, uh, but there's no, no easy answer. Because I say particularly, if, if you've got something like I supplying you with gas, you can just say, well, I don't want any more, and, and your costs go down immediately. Um, but if I'm supplying you with renewable electricity, and I'm incurring those costs, whether or not you buy it, how do I ensure I get decent revenue? Because otherwise, I just won't build them. Yeah, I see you disagree, but there we are. Uh, good to have a solution. Um, I, I'd like to ask about what UCL's view is and what advice they're giving the government at the moment around the uh, reappropriation or rebalancing of the tariffs um, between electricity, and when I say tariffs, I mean subsidies, between electricity and gas. So, you know, w we all know that we need to get off the gas grid. Gas is definitively fossil fuel based. You know, we, ha we haven't got 
you know, we haven't got a solution to that. Whereas, obviously, if we're going towards electricity, we need to be changing the balance of subsidies, which are, as I understand it, around about 12.5% or on, of the electricity per kilowatt hour we, we buy is subsidies, so-called green stroke social subsidies. But I'm asking you, because one of your slides there was indicating around 30%, I, just very roughly the pie chart. So the question really is, is it 30% or is it 12.5%? Off that 12.5% that, that comes from Ofgem, an Ofgem report, or an analysis of yes. Ofgem yes. figures. But is it 30% or is it 12.5%? You know, is it, is it well, and there are different and social obligations like eco and, and so yeah. on. And, yes. and I have to say, I don't have the details in here uh, for that. Um, and when uh, UCL's input to this, you know, there's, I don't know, I've got 100 colleagues, and uh, they have lots of different channels into this. So, for example, Michael Grab is looking at electricity pricing. We don't particularly agree with, with his view because we've done quite detailed analysis of this, how you might price electricity when you have lots of renewables and storage. How do you price that? Um, so I, I, there's no easy answer to... Uh, to either of your questions, actually. Sorry. Sorry, there was another question I want to ask regarding um, the figure, of, there was a, a two and a half thousand um, sort of cap that has been announced by the government. Um, are you aware of any of the details? Have they been released? I, I keep looking for the detail of that. So I know you spoke about it, but has there um, been any detail released? As I said, this two and a half thousand pounds is um, they're capping the standing charges for gas and electricity and the pence per kilowatt hour for those. And the idea is that, that where they've capped them at should mean your typical household is going to have a bill of two and a half thousand pounds. But of course, some will have a lot more, and some will have less. Um, so that's about the size of it, really. Um, the analysis that they've done behind that, uh, as far as I know, hasn't been released uh, to say what the effect on different types of households will be. Um, as, as I noted, uh, rich households use much more than poor households, generally, for various reasons. Um, so they've, they've taken this very, very simple approach of subsidising the, the, the prices and paying the fuel suppliers uh, to make up the difference between the wholesale market price and their selling price. Can I follow up on that, please? Um, when you say it's a subsidy, well, it's not really a subsidy because the government's borrowing the money and then it's expecting taxation to pay that extra back in the future. So we may have a cheaper bill for the next few months, but we'll have a higher bill in the future. So that's one problem. The other problem I want to ask about is, is how open-ended is the government's commitment to paying the difference between the cap and the wholesale prices, right? Because if it's an open-ended commitment by the government, you can see organizations like OPEC, who are meeting tomorrow, will say, ah, we'll cut supply. That'll push up the price. And the government is then on the hook for that extra price rise. Now, as well as OPEC, all these oil traders will be sitting there saying, yep. right, um, this is a one-way bet. We'll buy expensive oil and gas, wait for the price to go up, and sell it again. And I mentioned that public charity, Ineos, um, and we've had an example of the company that made um, uh, fertilizer. They had long-term contracts for gas at very cheap prices, and then they realized that the spot price had gone up, so they sold their cheap gas for a high price, then turned to the government and said, our gas price is now very high, yeah. can we have a subsidy? Yeah. So all these people are cashing in on this, and it seems to me, as far as I can, and Dermot was right to say we haven't got the detail yet, the government has entered into an open-ended commitment to pay the market what it wants, and we're on the hook for the cost. Well, the question is what, what the solution is. Nationalise. But we, we import we import fifty we import we import fifty five percent of our gas. You can't nationalise the Qatari or the.
Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Um, and again, I mean, ask what the solution is. Well, that's the next step. We need to identify the problem first. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I do agree with that. A question, um, really coming back to this question of electricity pricing, which absolutely baffles me. Um, is, it, what is the logic, what is the reason why the pricing of electricity produced by wind is being governed by the price of electricity produced by gas? It doesn't seem to be rational. I can't see a reason for it. Is, is there a, a moral reason? No. Um, any, any reason? Well, the competitive market theory is that you have these generators and at the bottom you've got, say, hydro and wind and solar and whether, you know, they don't incur extra costs by generating or very, very tiny costs. And so you stack up in, in increasing cost in any particular hour until you get to the top one. Now, when there's in, not enough wind and solar and nuclear, you then go into territory where you need to turn on uh, a generator which uses a stored fuel, which at the moment is mainly gas. Um, in the past it's been coal actually, uh, to quite a large extent, but the coal generators are more or less disappearing. And that price of that last generator sets the price that all of the generators below receive. What forces well, that? Is it just an arbitrary rule that then, somebody's then made, or is there a market is, reason why it has to happen that way? The incentive is that the, more, the lower you are below this marginal price, the more money you make, and so it drives down your costs. But that's all right when, in the past, it's been, you know, first of all you had coal, and then oil, and then gas, we had fossil fuel generators all the way from the bottom to the top, and so the, the more efficient generators are down the bottom, uh, and then you have the less efficient ones and using fuel. And that, that was, you know, pertinent 20 years ago before this renewable energy. But what's happening now is that a lot of the time is this renewable energy is coming up underneath and we've still got the same market structure. So, as I said, one of my last questions was, how do we structure the market such that you have these costs, you've built your wind turbine, so your costs are sunk, you know, let's say you've taken out a, ba a bank loan or something, but you need revenue to, to recoup your capital costs. So how does the market work when all of the generation is from renewables? And this is what we're struggling with at the moment. Um, and um, nobody, nobody's got a good answer to it. Okay, so I'm going to stop things there. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, so this, uh, I think we're going to have a bit of tea and coffee outside, hopefully. Uh, so uh, maybe a chance to, to catch up um, and maybe ask you one or two questions, but you have to go shortly. Don't I have you? to go so reasonably promptly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very there much you and thank you all for coming. Thank you.